get started. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I know there are several New Reps events. A lot of uh, people from UBC are in downtown right now. Uh, I could have been at uh, five other events. Uh, my name is Bushin Gopali. I'm a professor in chemical and biological engineering. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Sergey Levin from University of California, Berkeley. Um, there is a, there's an interesting Netflix uh, show. It's called My Guest, The Next Guest Doesn't Need an Introduction or something like that by David Letterman. So Sergey, Sergey won't need any introduction. But I'm just going to uh, quickly uh, say a couple of words about his background. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science from Stanford University. Uh, he also has a PhD uh, from Stanford University. And since then, has been working at their rival university, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he uh, is in the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering, and his work focuses on machine learning for decision making and control, with an emphasis on deep learning and reinforcement learning algorithms. So, without further ado, Sir D. Lemon. Thank you. So uh, I have maybe a, a slightly lofty title for today's talk, but hopefully I'll, I can uh, convince you at least a little bit that some of this stuff makes a little bit of sense. Um, so we'll start off with you know, things that are probably not controversial at this point, I think, as uh, a lot of you would likely agree. Deep neural networks work very well, at least in some set of applications. So they work very well, for example, for recognizing objects and images, uh, translating text, recognizing speech, and so on. Uh, to me, actually, something that's pretty interesting about current uh, deep learning models is not just that they can work well in difficult open world settings, but that when they make mistakes, sometimes those mistakes actually kind of make sense to us. Like, for example, uh, here is an, uh, uh, an image classification model. It thinks that this is a hummingbird. Uh, it's actually a bunch of bees, but you can kind of imagine why it might say this is a hummingbird because it's a hummingbird feeder and it's an animal that feeds on nectar. So if hummingbirds are things that use hummingbird feeders and feed on nectar, maybe that's not an unreasonable uh, inference to make. Uh, it says that this is a moss, um, when in fact it's an academic gown. Now here this is uh, actually at UC Berkeley, but these little spires might look a little bit like some kind of structure like a moss or a temple, so maybe not entirely unreasonable. Uh, here's an example from generative modeling. This is a, a generative model uh, called BigGAN, which synthesizes pictures. And BigGAN mostly synthesizes pictures that look realistic. But here it created kind of a cross between a tennis ball and a puppy, uh, which is not an object that exists in the world, but you know, it may be not, not an unreasonable thing in that it sort of looks like it could be a photograph. So uh, somehow the models don't just uh, you know, memorize what's going on, but they try to extrapolate, oftentimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, but in ways that perhaps make some sense. Unfortunately, they don't always make sense. And if we dig a little bit deeper, we can easily end up finding lots of situations where deep neural network models make mistakes that don't look like mistakes that a person would ever make. Um, here are a few examples. This is, these are borrowed from uh, Andre Karpathy and Fei Fei Li. These are image capturing models. So these are successful examples of good image captions. A group of people standing around a room with remotes, a young boy is holding a baseball bat, and pretty subtle uh, details that it picks up on. Uh, but it doesn't always do so well. So here is a toilet with a seat up in a bathroom, and here's a woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror. Uh, you can, again, kind of guess what's going on. You know, maybe the fuzzy uh, coat that this person is wearing looks a little like a teddy bear. But again, not the kind of thing that a person would ever uh, say, uh, because it's, it's so obvious from the functionality of these environments that whatever this is you know, doesn't fulfill the function of a toilet in a bathroom, and this doesn't fulfill the function of a teddy bear. Um, here is an example where there is an object detection model. It's detecting pretty much everything in this room, laptops, books, cups, chairs, etc. But when someone inserts an elephant into the background of the picture, then the model doesn't pick up on it. Even though to any person, it, you know, if you look at this long enough, this will really start jumping out at you as something that uh, ought to be uh, picked up on. And this is not just for vision. You know, in, in text, you could have, for example, a paragraph about the exploits of uh, Peyton Manning and uh, John Elway. Uh, and append one sentence describing how well the famous quarterback Jeff Dean did in Champ Bowl. And the model changes its answer to the question, what is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in, Super Bowl, in the Super Bowl from John Elway to Jeff Dean, uh, which, you know, while hilarious, uh, doesn't really 
uh, make any sense from actually looking at the text. So it's pretty clear that there's some heuristic that is being employed by the network that doesn't actually involve understanding the functionality of what's described in that passage. And here's a particularly kind of vivid example that I borrowed from a talk by Leon Batu, um, where an, um, a detector was trained to recognize people making a call. So making a call means you use a telephone, you hold a telephone, you speak into the telephone. But what the model ended up with is it ended up picking up on a selection bias in the data set because usually when you photograph people with a phone, it's because they're talking on the phone. So the association of the model that makes is that if there's a telephone in close proximity to a person, then that is a person making a call. But of course, a person could be just be standing next to a telephone as they are here, and that would also be detected as making a call because it satisfies the particular correlation seen in the data set, even though it completely fails at satisfying the functionality that's needed to make a call. So we might uh, wonder, you know, how can we fix this problem? How can we endow our learned models with a better notion of common sense? And there are a lot of ways we can begin approaching this. We can think about causality. We can think about all this stuff. Um, but uh, there's, there's an example uh, that I think, to me, makes it a little bit more vivid where, where the problem might really lie. And this is something called uh, Winograd schemas. Um, how many of you guys have heard about Winograd schemas? Can you raise your hand if you've heard about Winograd schemas? OK, not too many. Good. So then this, this won't be too boring. Um, so a Winograd schema is a type of uh, sentence followed by a question where answering the question requires more than just understanding the syntactic properties in the language, but actually understanding something about the functionality of what's being described. Let me give you an example. Here's a sentence. The trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. What was too big? Now, in a Winograd schema, there's a special word where changing that word changes the answer to the question. So in this case, the special word is big. If you change the special word to small, then the, the meaning of the question actually changes, right? The trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. What was too big? It was a trophy. The trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too small. What was too small? It was the suitcase. But in terms of the, the syntax and the parts of speech and so on, the sentences and the questions are identical. So that means that if you're not visualizing in your mind what the sentence actually means, if you're not imagining the functionality of these objects, it's very, very difficult to get the right answer. So when you read this sentence, you probably have some picture in your head, something you know, kind of of this nature. Uh, but of course, when a model trained uh, to recognize text and answer questions reads the sentence, it, you know, it's never seen people, it's never seen suitcases or trophies, so it can't imagine that kind of situation. And I think this example, uh, to me at least, gets to the heart of, uh, of the issue here, that the reason that common sense seems so common to us is because of the universe that we inhabit. So you know, our, our world, we, we're all hopefully familiar with it. It contains other agents. It contains objects. It contains physics. Uh, it contains sequential events. Uh, you know, all this stuff that we have to deal with that prepares us for understanding the world and answering things like Winograd schemas. The universe that a machine learning model inhabits, even though it might look kind of similar, even if it might involve image pixels, functionally is a very, very different world. So the universe for an image capturing model looks like this. It looks like a disconnected series of images and phrases. And while those images might provide the model with a glimpse into our world, the mechanics of this are completely different from the mechanics of this. And I think in many ways, that's actually getting to the heart of the issue. That you, There may be an analog to common sense in this universe, but it doesn't look like our common sense. And that's why you get these seemingly nonsensical uh, results sometimes. So what we would call common sense, maybe it emerges from embodied and situated learning. And perhaps we can't really hope to get that unless we have learning machines that are uh, you know, experiencing the same kind of world as we do. So uh, you know, some of you might be suspecting at this point that as a robotics and reinforcement learning researcher at this point, I might tell you that reinforcement learning will resolve all these issues. Uh, but the story is a little bit more nuanced than that. So reinforcement learning has worked very well in a range of domains. Uh, the basic idea behind reinforcement learning is that you have an agent that interacts with the world. It, you, it gets a little bit of data from that interaction, which it uses to update its model. And then it interacts with the world some more using that model, collects a little bit more data, and so on. And this is done many times. And if you do this properly and you set it up very carefully, integrate it with deep function approximators and things like that, then you can get pretty decent policies, for example, for playing some Atari games, controlling simple robotic tasks and simulation, and even in the real world, and doing things like playing board games like Go. And you can do those things actually very well. 
But if you look at these kinds of application domains where RL has succeeded, and you compare them to what our world looks like, or even to what the world of the image uh, uh, classification model looks like, there's a really big difference. Because these are all closed world environments. They are governed by relatively simple known rules, and there's, there are no intrusions of highly varied and diverse situations coming in from the outside. So the policy that's playing Go might do so very, very well, but it doesn't have to deal with you know, the opponent spilling coffee on the Go board. It doesn't deal with the kind of diverse, highly varied, and unexpected events that are uh, essentially ubiquitous in the real world. So there's a huge gulf between the kind of diversity and generalization that is demanded in the real world and the kind that we have actually seen from RL agents so far. And part of the issue here is that when you uh, train your reinforcement learning systems on narrow tasks, you get narrow notions of intelligence. And this happens in nature, too. So uh, you know, for example, insects are very, very proficient at the particular things they need to do, but we wouldn't call them intelligent by any measure uh, that we would uh, you know, plausibly use. And I think you know, the same thing in Atari games. Just because you can learn to play an Atari game doesn't mean you actually have an intelligent agent. It's essentially uh, a highly specialized creature that just exists in this very narrow world. And you know, the same is true, uh, the same can be true in the real world if that real world is constrained enough. So certainly, just because you have something that's working on a real physical system doesn't mean uh, that you overcome this issue. So that means that if you want things like common sense to emerge from embodied learning, you need broad, highly diverse tasks. And that's going to require lots and lots of experience. So this kind of setting, the current reinforcement learning setting, is a little hard to shoehorn into that uh, paradigm, because if you need broad tasks and lots of experience, that means that when you collect a little bit of data from the world, it can't be a little bit of data. It actually has to be a very diverse, very large data set. So maybe if you want generalization at the level of ImageNet from a robotic system, it needs to conduct, collect an ImageNet scale data set every time it goes this, around this loop. And of course, recollecting image net size data sets every iteration of your algorithm is never going to scale. So perhaps some, a more realistic kind of idealized embodied learning recipe might need to look something like this. That you have an agent that has interacted with the world before. It sort of has an existence, it has a lifetime. And from its lifetime, it has collected a large data set of past interactions that it can then utilize for off-policy reinforcement learning to train up a policy that generalizes effectively, and then maybe go back in and collect a little bit more data in the world if it needs to essentially fix up some issues with this current model. So the uh, kind of broad generalization in variance to visual distractors, understanding of physics, and so on, can come from this big data set of past experience, essentially everything you've done before. And then if you want to specialize into a particular task, maybe go back in and practice that task just a little bit more to really fine tune your model. And that, that I think is a lot closer to something that can meaningfully generalize. Now, this process has to be automated in order to scale. Because if you want broad generalization, if you want diverse data, then uh, if this thing requires manual effort every time you go around the loop, every time you collect uh, some data, that's, of course, uh, going to make it very onerous. And in particular, every part of the loop has to improve as you get more data. If there's some component of your system, let's say that you have a learned perception system, but a, a manually designed control system, well, your perception system will get, get better and better with data, but eventually the controller will end up the, being the bottleneck, and it doesn't matter how good your perception system is at that point. So any part that doesn't get better will eventually become the bottleneck. And a corollary to this is that any part that you have to design by hand will eventually become the bottleneck, because any part that you design by hand is not getting better with data. And this might seem a little bit abstract right now, but I'll actually discuss towards the end of the talk some actual situations where this is very uh, important in the domain of robotics. So basically, at a high level, the, the, the point here is that I think that common sense or the, you know, the ability to overcome these seemingly silly mistakes can come not necessarily just from algorithmic innovation, but from situating the learning in more realistic settings. Instead of having synthetic universes like the universe of the image captioning model, perhaps we can have much more realistic uh, settings in which our models can learn. And that will not only allow us to do interesting things like build robotic systems, but actually endow our models with some notion of common sense. So the learning from interaction could provide the grounding, the common sense. Learning from large data sets of prior experience can provide the sort of diversity and learning autonomously can make all this scalable. So with that, what I'd like to talk about uh, for the technical portion of today's talk uh, is some of the research uh, you know, that I've been involved with in over the past few years 
that gets us some components that I think might be important uh, to make that a reality. So I'll start with uh, this question. Can robots learn skills from large amounts of experience that generalize in realistic settings? And I think this question is important because uh, we have to first understand that reinforced learning methods can actually generalize in the same way as supervised learning methods to diverse settings. And of course, the diversity in this setting won't be quite as drastic as the you know, open world image captioning setting, but maybe it's a step in that direction. And then I'm going to talk about ways that we can relieve some of the burden on manual uh, uh, engineering and manual design to essentially make this whole thing scalable. So first I'll talk about how you can remove the requirement for hand designing reward functions and actually collect data in an unsupervised way to improve the generalization capability of reinforcement learning agents. And then I'll talk about the other stuff. Besides reward functions, what else do we need to do to make real world embodied learning fully autonomous? How can we remove those barriers uh, that prevent the machine from getting better and better purely through its own unattended experience? But let me start with the first question. And uh, this is, you know, this first question is almost like kind of a, the, the goal is to give a proof of existence to say that yes, reinforcement learning can uh, scale in the same way that we've seen uh, for supervised, let's say, computer vision systems. So, as I mentioned before, the kind of recipe that, uh, that we need in order to make RL scalable in the real world is an off-policy recipe where you have a large data set of experience, you use that large data set of experience, which you can formally say is a set of tuples, state, action, and next state, to train a model for many, many epochs uh, from the task reward. So the idea is that the amount of training you need to do is sort of decoupled from the amount of work you need to do to collect the data. But then if your model is not quite good enough in terms of its coverage of physical situations, then you can go in and collect a little bit more data to fix it up. So um, here's how we can go about doing this. So this is, you know, this might be stuff that's already very familiar to many of you, but in reinforced learning, our objective overall is to maximize the expected value of the reward summed over time. So you don't just maximize the reward right now, you actually maximize the reward over an entire episode with respect to your policy pie. And a very useful object for doing this is something called the Q function. So the Q function tells you if you start in a particular state and then take a particular action and then follow the policy pi, what will be the total reward that you will accumulate? And if you can learn or calculate the Q function for a given policy, then you can always recover a policy that is as good or better just by taking an action with probability of one if it's the R max of the Q function. And this basic principle can serve as the foundation for an algorithm called policy iteration, which alternates between calculating a Q function and then recovering a better policy. You can shortcut this process a little bit by not even bothering with the policy recovery and instead writing down an equation that an optimal Q function has to obey. And this equation could be derived as such a limited case of this interaction. And if you can enforce this equation that your Q function at state SA is equal to the reward plus the max over the Q function at the next state, then you can actually show that the resulting Q function will correspond to the optimal policy, and then you're done. So if you can enforce this equation on your big data set from past interactions, then you can approximate an optimal Q function insofar as this big data set provides coverage of the states that you will see. And of course, if it doesn't provide coverage, then you go out and get more data. So that's the basic principle. It's a very, very simple principle. It's been with us for, for decades at this point. And we're not going to reinvent the principle. We're just going to scale it up. Now, that's maybe understating some of the algorithmic challenges in doing this, and I will kind of gloss over them, because what I want to talk about more is, is what you get when you do this. So this is a project that we did about a year and a half ago at this point called Qt Opt. Uh, and this was a, uh, some work done at Google on scaling up deep reinforcement learning in the real world. So you have a setup where you have uh, multiple robots that are all collecting data in parallel. Why is it multiple robots? Well, because if you want generalization, uh, you need lots of experience, and while one robot can collect the experience you want in a year, if you put in uh, 12 of them, they can collect that data in a month. So this is purely a pragmatic decision. And then you have all the data that you've stored from all the past experiences that you've done before. So everything these robots did, logged to disk, uh, saved on the server, and that's what, this, that's what sits in this bucket here. So as this process is happening, where we have these buffers that we're going to use for training, we're going to pull in data from disk, uh, that's going to be our off policy data. And we'll also pull in live data from the robots. That's that bit that says collect a little bit more data. And that goes into an on policy buffer and is also stored to disk for later reuse in subsequent experiments. 
And now our goal is to do Q-learning. So our goal is to minimize the left-hand side and uh, the difference between the left-hand side and right-hand side of that equation from before. So minimize Q minus R plus next to Q. So uh, one of the tricky things about this is that you have to actually calculate that, that max. So you have your Q function is a deep neural net. And we're going to have these uh, workers that are called Bellman updaters. And they're going to crawl over these buffers. And they'll just calculate the right-hand side of that equation. They'll calculate the R plus the max. And this is a little tricky in a robotic setting because the max, of course, requires a continuous optimization because your action is continuous. So these guys are actually doing a fair bit of work. And when they calculate their target values, they'll push labeled tuples back into the buffer, state, action, and the calculated targets. And then you're going to have a separate set of jobs that will crawl over this labeled buffer, and they'll actually train the Q function by minimizing the difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Yes? Uh, so is the, are the policies entirely asynchronous throughout the training period? Or? Yeah, everything is, is, is asynchronous. So th this is, you know, in, in many ways, this is actually a systems engineering project because you have asynchronous collection, asynchronous training, asynchronous Bellman updaters. You actually also have an asynchronous buffer. But if I had to explain that, I think I'd be here all day. Um, so it, it, it's kind of this amorphous, fully asynchronous thing. And that's important partly because you have to deal with the throughput of this whole thing. So even if we had the ideal off-policy data, which is an experiment that we tried, at least in simulation, just the training would take several days. So you really need this kind of machinery to deal with the, the diverse and large data set. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use this framework for robotic grasping. So sensing comes from an over-the-shoulder camera that observes a 472 by 472 image. Actions correspond to movement and opening and closing of the gripper. Uh, there's no depth sensing. There's no anything really, uh, just these monocular RGB images. So we want to keep it simple. And we're going to train on about 1,000 training objects. We don't know exactly how many training objects we had, because this thing took several months, and people kept going to Safeway and buying more objects. Uh, so the only thing that we really made sure of was that the test objects were never touched. They were in a big box that says test objects uh, that were never mixed into the training. But other than that, I don't actually know exactly how many objects there were in the training set. Uh, there were about 600,000 training grasp attempts, so this took uh, about two or three months. Uh, and the Q function network was pretty large. It was this big convolutional stack with about 1.2 million parameters, which is tiny by modern computer vision standards, but it's enormous by reinforcement learning standards. So we're you know, sort of partway through that gap. The only grasping specific property of the system is actually the reward function, which is one if the object is grasped successfully which at first seems like a nice thing because it means this whole thing is very general, but I'll tell you later why there's a little bit of a dirty secret to this. Uh, but yeah, that was really the only grasping specific feature. And if you train this up and you use enough diverse data, it works quite well. So the tests that you're going to see are evaluating the system on novel previously unseen objects and with some novel previously unseen perturbations. And one of the things that to me was really interesting about this experiment is that the resulting policy exhibits some very interesting emergent behavior that's very much unlike traditional robotic grasping systems. So if you perturb it in some way, it'll actually react immediately to your perturbation, and it will try to regrasp the object, reposition the gripper, and so on. Sometimes it will mess up, but when it messes up, it actually sees that it messed up, repositions the gripper, and immediately gives it another try. So here. It uh, kind of miscalculated how much it could pinch this object, so it's going to reposition the grip or try a few times until it actually finds a grasp that works pretty well. And it works in very cluttered environments on objects that are large, small, transparent, opaque, soft, rigid, etc. We uh, constructed a pretty difficult test set of objects uh, with you know small, big, transparent, etc. Things, and we got a success rate of about 96% on this. The 4% of the failures are on the octopus. So if you don't have any cephalopods in your test set, it actually works a bit better than that. Yeah. Does it ever get stuck and try to do something over and over again without making yeah. any progress? Yeah, so it actually does. So it's, it's a memoryless, fully reactive policy. So that means that if it screws up in one particular way, that doesn't mean that it won't screw up that way again. Yeah. In practice, that doesn't happen that often, because usually if it messes up, it moves the object, so then it sees something a little different. All right. So one of the things I mentioned is that there's a, a little bit of a dirty secret behind that. And the dirty secret is that that reward function, it's one if you grasp the object, which seems very, very simple. But in the physical world, nothing is ever that simple. Because for grasping, grasping is a little special. You always know whether you've succeeded. You can you know, look at what you're holding, see if there's anything in your gripper, or just check the encoder reading on your gripper. We had an image subtraction test where you just drop the object and see if the image changed. So it's very easy to figure out if you succeeded at that task. For most other tasks, it's not nearly that easy. 
In fact, for most other tasks, if you're learning them from images with a robotic system, determining whether you've reached a successful outcome is actually an entire research problem in itself. And that's actually one of the things that makes it a little tricky to apply that general recipe to a broader range of problems. So one of the things I want to talk about next is whether we can actually dispense with the reward function altogether and get meaningful learning to emerge without having to specify any single task objective. So what if we have no supervision at all? Can you have agents that invent their own tasks to practice in order to learn about the world, and then maybe after that unsupervised interaction, someone can come along and specify an objective, perhaps manually, and the agent could adapt this knowledge to solve that new task? I'll talk about other ways that you could specify tasks later on, but for now, we'll mostly focus on the first part. How can you invent your own tasks to practice in the absence of any supervision? So what I'm talking about here is essentially this, that in the same way that you might have a child play with objects in the world and through that interaction learn something about how the world works, we'd like autonomous agents that can play with things in their environment, have unsupervised interactions, but from those unsupervised interactions, extract knowledge that they could use to perform tasks later down the line. One of the things that you might notice is that um, the child is not moving their limbs randomly. They are, you know, while, while they might have nonsensical goals, they, they clearly have goals and intentions in mind uh, when they interact with the world. And that's what we'd like to do, too. We'd like to have our agents that have intentions, just their own made-up intentions. So we're going to have a system that will work like this. It'll generate a goal to start with for itself. And a goal here will be a state. And our states will be images, so raw pixel observations. So if you want to generate a goal, which is a state, which is an image, you need a generative model. The generative model that we'll use for this experiment is something called a variational autoencoder, although many other choices could be viable here, too. So it's not specific to, to that. You just need some generative model. And in the variational autoencoder, you have a latent state, Z, and you have a, an observation X. So these are your images. These are your states. So the way that you sample uh, from your autoencoder is you essentially sample a Z from your prior, and then you sample an image from your decoder. So that gives you a synthetic image, which you can treat as your goal. And then you will attempt to reach that goal with your policy. So a policy gives you an action, conditional on a state, and then will also condition on the goal. So it's conditioned on two states, the current one and the goal state. So what does it mean to reach the goal in the case of the image? Is just to find yourself in a viewpoint that actually is close to the yeah. goal? So uh, in the case of, this, of the BAE, it actually, we have to define it as a design choice. But the choice that we'll make is that the latent code corresponding to that image is close to the latent code that you sample. So then, from attempting to reach that goal, you get a little bit of data. And then you can use that data to update your goal generator. And you can also use that same data to update your policy. So the policy is updated to achieve higher goal-reaching reward. And the generator is updated to assign a higher likelihood to all the data seen so far. So it's a fairly sensible procedure, set goal, attempt to reach goal, collect data, use the data to improve both the goal setter and the policy. So at training time, the agent essentially invents its own goals, tries to reach them. And then at test time, we need to somehow tell the agent what to do. This is actually itself a fairly deep problem involving kind of human-computer interaction. But we'll punt on that problem for now. And we'll just say that at test time, the user will just give the agent an image. So if the agent learned to reach images, if you give it an image, it will attempt to reach that image. I'm sure you can do better than that. You can do text and things like that. But we'll just keep that part simple, because we don't want to get too much into the interface question. So there's a problem with this recipe. The problem with this recipe is that if you set goals for yourself by sampling from a generative model, and the generative model is trained on your own experience, then as soon as you get really good at doing something, you'll sample lots of images that are similar to that, and you'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Right? Because when you train your generative model with max likelihood, that gives the largest likelihood to things you've seen the most often, which are probably the things that you're pretty good at already. So that's not actually, by itself, a very good recipe. But there's a small modification that we can make that'll make it work a lot better. So let's say that your agent lives in this 2D environment, and the circles represent the states that the agent has visited. What you would like to do is you would like to figure out that these states out on the tails of the distribution are somehow more rare, and therefore ought to play a, a bigger role in the sampling of goals, because you're probably not as good at reaching them as you are at reaching these very dense states here in the corner. So what you can do is you can take the samples that you've collected, they define a particular empirical distribution, and you can skew that distribution by upweighting the tails. 
And it turns out that a very convenient way to do this is to simply weight the data points by one over the probability of those points under your previous generative model raised to some power. And you want to, as long as you use any power uh, between zero and one, you can actually, the methods can be proven to work. And in practice, you might want to use a small power so that your distribution is not too sharp. And then you refit your um, generative model to the skewed distribution, and that will raise the probabilities on the tails, sample your goals from that, visit the resulting states, and you'll get better coverage. In fact, you can actually prove that if the skewing procedure is implemented properly, you will increase the entropy of the goal distribution at every iteration, and at convergence, actually, your uh, generative model, if it's an idealized generative model, will represent the uniform distribution over all valid states. So why don't you start with the uniform? Yeah, so why don't we start with the uniform distribution right away? Well, in simple state space, that's pretty easy to do. So here, you know what the uniform distribution is. Just take this bit and assign equal probability. For images, it's a lot harder. Because the space of valid images is defined by a very thin, very complicated manifold in the space of all possible images. So you typically don't know what it is. Because I guess the question is then you want to kind of sample along that manifold. The question, the question is whether you start with a simple distribution and you kind of you know, increase such a probability in the tail. Are you going to be in a good place, or is that a good strategy? Yeah. So uh, the thing that we can prove is that if your reinforcement learning algorithm works properly and your generative model works properly, then this weighting scheme will recover the uniform distribution. Properly means it doesn't overfit, it doesn't underfit, and all that stuff. Yes? So it's like over like achievable goals, is what you're saying. It's like uniform distribution over like goals that you can actually reach, or you should. Correct. Reach. Yeah, so, so you will never you know, learn to set goals that you've, never seen, that you've truly never seen before. So the regularity assumptions are like, you know, you need, that's the usual stuff in RL. You need an ergodic MDP. You need uh, to, to be able to actually represent things so you can't have you know, function approximation error in any significant way, all this other stuff. But yeah, under, under the usual, perhaps unreasonable regularity assumptions. Yes? So that means uh, we can do an adversarial attack by adding some sparse data so that uh, it will start training on it, right? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so I think that there's a lot you can do in general for in terms of adversarial attacks on RL agents. So you could certainly inject, uh, you know, fictitious goals that really screw it up. I think you could probably cause a lot of havoc even without going to that trouble. Um, I'm not going to cover it in this talk, but we do actually have some work on adversarial attacks on RL agents that I could talk about offline as well. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see this in action. So this is an experiment that we did where we took a robot. And we sort of put it in front of a door. Uh, we didn't tell it to open the door, but we kind of winked at it a little bit so that it, uh, it knows what's up. Uh, but you know, a priori, it doesn't really understand that the door is a thing that can be opened. So the first thing that it learns is to set a bunch of goals for itself to move its hand to different positions. But once it starts accidentally opening the door, then it immediately starts upweighting those images because they have a much lower probability under the current generative model. And then it sets many more goals that involve manipulating the door. So after about 25 hours of unattended training, it gets pretty good at playing around with the door. And then we can come along and we can test it. So in this video, in the lower right corner, you'll see a goal image provided by a user. And we'll just sort of exercise it here. We'll give it goals in sequence for opening the door to different angles, just to make sure that it can open to all different angles. So uh, here, we're asking it to keep the door fully closed. Now we're asking it to open a little bit. Then we ask it to open a little bit more, and so on. And it goes through all these different angles and can perform them successfully. And this is, of course, trained from images uh, without any other reward supervision uh, other than the skull reaching. All right, uh, yes? So what keeps the agent from getting stuck at the state standard value but useless? For example, uh, bringing the group to the top of the picture. I mean, yeah. So there's nothing that prevents it from uh, trying to do, execute those useless goals. The only thing that, uh, that prevents it from getting stuck there is that it is trying to diversify uh, the goal set. So once it figures out how to do that, then it will go and do other things. But it, the door opening is not privileged in any way over moving the gripper. So that's why first it moves the gripper to different places and only then starts playing with the door. So there's, I think, kind of maybe a, almost like a philosophical question that uh, comes up after thinking about these kinds of techniques, which is that so far, when we wanted to adjust our goal distribution, we did so by identifying unusual states and essentially telling the system that unusual states should be upweighted and, and so on. 
And this is not by itself a new idea. So unsupervised RL, uh, the kind of the conventional wisdom is that it should be treated as intrinsic motivation, which is a novelty-seeking process. And there's a lot of previous work, both on unsupervised reinforcement learning and also on exploration, that essentially builds on this idea that says, if you're not sure about what to do, seek out novel states, and eventually you'll discover the right thing. So there's quite a bit of uh, research that explores various facets of that idea. But is this actually a good idea in realistic settings? Is novelty seeking actually a good uh, intrinsic motivation objective? So in typical reinforcement learning environments, and the kind of environments that we use for benchmarks, usually they're set up in such a way that if the agent doesn't do anything interesting, the environment will not react in any interesting way. So this is the half-cheetah benchmark task, very popular task for reinforcement learning benchmarking. And in the half-cheetah benchmark task, unless you execute a fairly coordinated sequence of actions, you'll kind of sit in one spot and wiggle a little bit, and nothing particularly interesting will happen. Uh, for an actual cheetah, uh, it needs to do things like you know, hunt down gazelles uh, to get some, something to eat. And surprising things will happen to it. So sometimes it's chasing the gazelle, and sometimes some other animal is chasing it. In real environments, surprising events happen on their own. You don't need to go out and look for them. So agents in realistic environments, perhaps they don't need to seek out surprise. Perhaps the bigger challenge for them is actually the opposite. Perhaps in, in more realistic settings, high uh, you know, entropy increases on its own and surprising events take place. And we actually know that this is true because of the second law of thermodynamics. Right? In our universe, entropy increases which means that unexpected things will take place. That's what entropy means. So the real challenge maybe in these settings is not seeking out surprise. It's actually the opposite. It's finding a stable niche for yourself where you can maintain homeostasis. That's a, it's a guess. That's a, that's a speculation. But maybe we can examine this guess a little bit and set up some experiments to probe whether maintaining homeostasis can by itself serve as a suitable intrinsic motivation objective in unsupervised reinforcement learning. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to design an agent that does not seek out surprise, but instead tries to maintain homeostasis. And then we'll test that agent in environments that naturally present lots of surprising events because of their dynamics. So we have our agent right there. And that agent has a belief. It has a, a density model over states that we're going to call p theta of s. So maybe if the agent is playing Tetris, you turn on the game, and it sees a mostly empty Tetris board, so it says, oh, I believe empty Tetris boards have a high probability. So if it later sees a really full Tetris board, it'll say, oh, this probably has low probability, because everything I've seen so far looks like that. So it has some kind of belief. And it'll observe a state from the world. And when it observes a state, it will do the rational thing, which is it will update its belief. Right? So it gets a little bit more data, update the belief, so that you assign high likelihood to all the data you've seen so far. And then you'll take an action. And the goal for this agent in taking that action will be to maximize the log probability of the next state that it sees under its beliefs. So it's trying to basically avoid things that it doesn't understand. It wants to seek out things that agree with its beliefs. So as in all reinforcement learning, the objective is to maximize the expected value of the reward. And the reward here is log p theta of s. But crucially, this agent understands that its beliefs will change. So it wants to maximize the probability of the state under its belief, but it knows that its beliefs will change. So it can change the reward by changing the state, by going to states that currently have a high probability, or it can change its beliefs. So it can go to states that will cause its beliefs to change, and then stay there and collect those rewards. So as a little cartoon example uh, that, uh, that one of the authors on this paper, Colleen, uh, put together, let's say that you have a robot and it's you know, hanging out outdoors. Uh, it has, there's, there's sun, there's rain, there's night, day, etc. So it's a, it's a very vari varied environment. If it builds a house for itself, somehow, uh, then it'll first be quite surprised, because it's never seen the inside of a house before. But the inside of that house forms a much more stable environment, so after a while, it'll actually be pretty happy, because it gets to collect all those rewards from those low entropy states. So you might do something that increases surprise so that you can minimize surprise later. And that's very important, because that's what's going to lead to interesting emergent behavior from this objective. So um, here's an experiment that we did with this basic formula for playing Tetris. Uh, we don't actually tell the agent the reward function for Tetris. All we do is we start it up, let it update its beliefs. So the beliefs are shown here on the right-hand side. The yellow colors indicate high probability of there being a block. The blue colors indicate low probability. 
and it essentially learns to play Tetris without receiving any reward signal because Tetris is an environment where surprising things happen on their own and the best way to maintain homeostasis is just clear the board. Here is a reinforcement learning benchmark task based on the uh, game Doom. So this is the, the hold the line this Doom benchmark. Here there is a task objective, it's to avoid the fireballs and shoot those little snake things. Uh, but for this experiment, we didn't give the agent any reward function. We just told it again to minimize surprise. And this is a plot of the log P of S. And you can see that the probability of the state dips when there's a, a fireball close to the screen. That's because that's a more surprising event. And the best way to maintain homeostasis is to clear the board of as many enemies as you can, because that gives you a more stable state. Here is a continuous control example. So here, this little bipedal robot starts off at the edge of a cliff and is given a push that will cause him to fall off unless he takes actions to avoid this. And of course, a much better way to maintain homeostasis is to stay on the top of the cliff, because if you fall off, you'll experience lots of pretty surprising events. Now, of course, a very reasonable criticism of this is that we, you know, we set up the environments where these kind of emergent behaviors have to take place. But I would actually argue that environments where surprising events happen on their own are much more representative of what happens in the real world than the kind of RL benchmarks where the only interesting thing that happens happens because you cause it to happen. So while this is you know, admittedly a little bit of uh, environment engineering, I think it's actually more representative of the real world in many ways. And, and of course, quantitatively, this you know, behaves the way that you'd expect. But maybe the high, the high level point here is that in realistic environments, maybe the real challenge is maintaining homeostasis, and maybe we should worry less about novelty seeking. OK. Uh, yes? Uh, is there a way to switch between the surprise maximization and minimization? Yeah. Uh, there is, but actually you don't even have to. So this is a little bit of a subtle point, but they're not actually opposites of each other. Because you can use surprise, this is, this is going to sound a little weird, but I promise you that's true. You can use surprise maximization to get better at surprise minimization. You can essentially use surprise maximization to find all the different things you can do, and then among those things, pick the one that minimizes surprise. So while they seem like they're opposites of each other, in a subtle way they're actually not. So that was the fully unsupervised picture of reinforcement learning. Uh, in the last part of today's talk, I want to go back to something a little, a little more pragmatic and talk about some of the practicalities of embodied and situated reinforcement learning in the real world and how we can automate that better. So what does it really take to run reinforcement learning on real world systems like robots? We've done quite a bit of work on this in my lab. For example, we had an experiment on getting a robotic hand to open a door. We thought it was pretty neat because it could open the door on its own. But of course, we needed to assign a reward function to it somehow. And in this case, we didn't want to do an unsupervised thing. We wanted to actually give it rewards. So what did we do? Well, we did the usual thing that, that we would do in an engineering department. We set up a little device on the inside of the door. It's a little spool with some rope and an encoder at the bottom here, which measures the angle of the door. So in earlier versions of the system, the robot would learn this pretty cool behavior, would grab the handle and shake it vigorously so that it could unwind the spool and get reward when it didn't deserve it. Um, here's an experiment that we did on, again on door opening actually, a year prior to that at Google. Here we wanted to do it at a larger scale to study generalization. Uh, again, there's a sensor on the door, but you might also notice that there is this guy, this is the first author actually, Ali Yaya, who is going around and closing the doors. Why is he doing that? Well, because the robots are trying to learn to open them, not to close them. So someone else has to come along and close them. Uh, more recently, uh, my student Anusha Nagabandi did some experiments on dexterous manipulation, where she wanted to get this robotic hand to learn how to rotate two objects in the palm. And we were pretty happy with this result that it could learn to rotate the objects in just a couple of hours. But nonetheless, during those two hours, it would drop them pretty frequently. And uh, Anusha was a little bit more inventive, so she didn't want to keep picking them up all the time herself. So this is what she built instead. Uh, now, we might say this is kind of clever. It's uh, solving the problem in a sense. But it's not really solving the problem. Because if I wanted this robot to open a door in your home, or I wanted this robot to manipulate objects in your kitchen, you, know, you probably don't have a second robot in your kitchen that can reset things, and you probably don't have encoders on your doors in your home. So while it allows us to study the algorithms, it doesn't really allow us to study the complete system. And remember this corollary, that any part of this process that doesn't improve with data will eventually become the bottleneck. So eventually, as our algorithms get better and better, the thing that will hold them back is the ability to do all the scaffolding if that requires manual engineering. So what do we need to get fully autonomous real-world reinforcement learning? We need to learn using only the robot sensors, so we can't afford to instrument our environment for perception. We need to use 
you know, things like cameras, touch sensing, etc. We need to define rewards in terms of measurable quantities. So we can't assume that you have a little encoder on your door. Uh, we need to maybe somehow use perception to figure that out. And we need to get the robot to try again on its own. So you can't assume that there's a second machine that will just reset everything. So if something needs to be reset, it has to take care of it on its own without any external knowledge or engineering. So I'll start with the, first, with the, with the number two question. So I've already talked about number one. That was in the first part of the talk. I'll talk about number two next. How do you specify rewards? So in some tasks, like Atari games, the rewards are pretty obvious. They're right there on the screen. But let's say that you want a robot to arrange your bookshelf in a tidy way, or you want a, uh, a robot to put uh, you know, a tablecloth on a table, pretend this is a very small table. You know, here you want to lay out the tablecloth so there are very few wrinkles. How do you define a wrinkle? Well, it's a, it's a perceptual thing. You need to use vision. So maybe you can specify rewards using data. Maybe what you can do is you can give some examples to say, like, these are good ways to put your book on the bookshelf. And maybe this is like a bad way to put your, your book on the bookshelf. And then do what we know how to do best in deep learning, train a classifier. Just say, these are positive examples, this is negative. Train your classifier, get a reward, and then optimize for your classifier to output the success label. <clears throat> it's a very reasonable idea, but it can get you into a lot of trouble. So here what I'm going to show is some simulated experiments that my student Avi Singh did. This is uh, showing RL with a ground truth reward. So the goal here is to get this green object onto the red circle. And the reward is 1 if you do it, and 0 otherwise. So the plot here shows the reward. You can see it spikes up to 1 when the green cylinder is on the circle. Now, this is a fairly difficult reward to optimize because it's a sparse reward task. So unless you accidentally put the green thing on the circle many times, it's actually pretty hard to learn. But this is mainly just to illustrate to you what the task is. If you train a classifier for this task, and you optimize the log probability of the classifier, this is what you get. So the classifier thinks these are successes. The classifier is very happy. Uh, but it's also pretty apparent that the robot is not actually doing what it's supposed to do. In fact, one thing you might notice is that on most of the episodes, it takes these two fingers, and it points them upwards into the camera. Why is it doing that? Well, because it'll fool the classifier into outputting success. So just figured out this one particular motion caused the classifier to make a mistake. And uh, you know, kind of like the evil genie that it is, it's, it solves your problem in exactly not the way that you want. So it turns out that there's a fix to this problem. This is essentially a, a real, you know, this is a RL finding an adversarial example, essentially. Uh, the way that you fix this is by um, a little mathematical trick that we call variational inverse control with events. And the main idea behind this trick, it's actually very quite simple. Anything that the robot does gets added to the training set and labeled as a negative. Now, at this point, you might think, well, that's a bad idea, because what if the robot does the task successfully? Well, if the robot does the task successfully, it's also added as a negative. But you have one data set that has only positives, and one data set has positives and negatives. So the, 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 the true positives will always have a higher probability of being positive than the true negatives. So even though the pollution might mess up the calibration of the probabilities, the positives will still be larger than the negatives, and the robot will be incentivized to do the right thing. So, so why do you do that? So don't you know when the robot does the task successfully? So you, why do you have yeah. to add that to it? So, so the point here is that we don't have for, for these experiments, these two here, there's no knowledge of the reward function except what is provided by those positive examples in the beginning. So the ground truth function here is just shown for your, benefit, for your uh, uh, illustration. It's not actually known to the system. Oh, I see. So the basic process for, for VICE is very, very simple. You provide some initial positive examples, and then everything that the policy does is added as a negative, and then the classifier log probabilities are used as the reward. And that turns out to actually work decently well in a range of settings. There's a little improvement that we can make. Uh, we could also occasionally query a person to ask them if a, given po if a given negative example is actually a positive. You don't have to do this. The algorithm still converges. But it turns out to converge much, much faster if you allow a limited number of human queries on the order of a few dozen. So that kind of fixes up some of those mistakes. Uh, and across a range of kind of real world tasks, we find that the hybrid method that uses vice and a little bit of human queries actually tends to do pretty well. Uh, if you just do active queries, it does pretty poorly. If you just do vice, it sometimes works, but not always. And if you use a naive classifier, it basically never works because the reinforcement learning agent can always figure out how to exploit it. Here are some examples of real world experiments. This is an image based task where the goal is to push the cup onto the coaster. So the robot is given some positive examples. And then it's allowed to train for about an hour and 15 minutes. 
it uh, executes 25 additional queries during this time, but in an hour and 15 minutes, it actually pretty reliably learns to move the cup to the coaster. So that's a nice test to make sure this thing works, and it's actually quite efficient. Here's a more complex task. This is a task where it's very difficult to specify a reward function by hand because you need to understand, you know, somewhat define that the, the towel is draped uh, without wrinkles. And with this method, it does actually do the task quite successfully. We want to make sure that Perceptor is actually needed to solve the task. So to do that, we program the robot to move to the right end effector position, but without using vision. And that, in fact, does not work very well. So you'll see in a second, uh, it's not actually able to do the task that way. So this is just a test to make sure that the vision is actually important for the task. All right. Now let's talk about that third problem. Can we get the robot to try again? Can we avoid having to like, reset the environment every time it attempts the task? So uh, as an example, uh, let's, let's use that cup pushing example from before uh, to, to think about this. In a standard reinforcement learning procedure, you would attempt the task, you would improve the policy, and then the environment would be reset so the cup would be moved back up to the top, and then you attempt it again. So then at test time, the environment is reset, and your policy does the task successfully. So the reset, in a sense, encodes some knowledge. It encodes knowledge about the initial state distribution from which your policy will be tested. If you don't have resets, now imagine what will happen. The robot will push the cup to the, to the coaster, and then it will just sit there forever. So at training time, you attempt the task. If you're not done, you approve the policy. But if you're done, if it's sitting on the coaster, the policy will basically do nothing. The optimal thing for it to do at this point is to basically disengage and to learn to sit and wait. So then at test time, when you reset the environment, it will fail because it sees a state for which it didn't get a chance to practice. In fact, it probably has forgotten how to do the task altogether by that point because most of its existence involved <coughs> having the object sit at the target. So uh, what we've uh, tried to do to address this issue is to introduce something that we call a perturbation controller. So the idea here is that the policy, let, let's say that uh, you want to reach this location. Your policy, indicated with a green line, tries to get close to it, and then the perturbation controller will push it away. So the perturbation controller, specifically, will optimize an objective that tries, like before, to maximize novelty. So it will try to visit states that have not been visited very often to force the policy to attempt the task from those novel states. And crucially, the perturbation controller um, will actually be trained in the loop with this whole process. So the perturbation controller forces the policy to succeed from a range of different states, and it's trained together with the policy so it's fully automated. So then at test time, when the environment is reset to a new state, so long as the perturbation controller did its job and achieved good coverage, then the policy should succeed at the task. I guess by the time you actually do perturbation, you have some kind of a trace that you could use maybe for some sort of imitation learning. You start from the goal, you perturb. Yeah. So you have well, yeah. Of, you know, these intermediate states, and you could kind of... Right. So, you, you, so you basically, in order to estimate this novelty, you use the states from both the forward and the perturbation control. OK. Uh, so let, let's see some examples of this in action. Uh, we're going to test on this uh, kind of funny task. So the, the goal here is to use this robotic hand with these three fingers to move two beads to the left and two beads to the right. So you have to make it symmetric. So you start off in some arbitrary configuration, and you have to move it so that two beads are to the left and two beads are on the right. And we're going to try to do this uh, with, from raw image observations using learned classifier rewards and without any manual resets. So here's a video recording of the entire training process. So this is generating positive examples for the classifier. So uh, here, the student put the beads two on the left, two on the right, and just moved the hand into random positions. And those are the positives. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit manual. It takes a couple minutes. So then you give it the thumbs up. And then you turn on the automatic training. And then you go home and sleep uh, while the robot executes the policy and the perturbation controller in all training fashion. And we have the clock there, just so you can see that. Uh, halfway through, we came in and evaluated it, just for, for evaluation purposes. And it kind of works half the time so far. Uh, so then you go, go and get some coffee, maybe get some lunch, uh, maybe go to sleep again, because it's going to take about 24 hours. But fortunately, it's 24 hours that the robot is working, and you're not working. You're just waiting. So there it goes. And then once training is completed, then you can test it again, and then it will work pretty much from any configuration of the beads. Now, of course, this is a you know, somewhat limited task, and it's still a work in progress to scale this up to more complex 
uh, more elaborate, more open world situations. So here are a few test scenarios. We put the beads into all sorts of different configurations and just made sure that it could actually arrange them properly uh, with the learn, learn policy. So it takes a little while sometimes, but always gets them in the right place in the end. Okay, so to summarize, I talked about how uh, learning from interaction can provide as a sort of grounding, this sort of common sense. And to try to, try to study this a little bit, I discussed how robots can learn skills from large amounts of experience that generalize in realistic settings, how robots uh, can learn without any reward function, and also how we can automate much of the scaffolding that we need for real world RL. So I'd like to make sure to thank the students and postdocs that were involved in this work, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So you, you mentioned uh, using basically off-policy reinforcement learning. Um, there's been a lot of work in like how you pick examples in your off-policy, uh, but a lot a lot of times you basically just do uh, kind of like a moving window of however many mm -hmm. examples you can use in yeah. memory. Uh, what do you think is uh, some of the more interesting directions in picking examples for your kind of replay? Yeah, program? it's an interesting question. So uh, for the for the large-scale uh, grasping work, we really didn't do any of that. We we basically just sampled randomly, uniformly from the whole buffer. I think that one of the things that might be really important in setting this up is to consider whether you're, you're, what you're after is efficiency or robustness. And those two are not always the same thing. So one of the things you could consider is that your data in your buffer came from some distributions, which are probably not the same as the distribution that you'll see when you actually act in the world. And maybe one of the things that you want is actually robustness to distributional shift. So then your goal in sampling might not necessarily be to sample the most interesting or the most relevant examples. It might actually be to sample the things that will make you robust to distributional shift. And that's maybe a more important criteria if you're in this regime where data is precious and computation is comparatively less expensive. Uh, so the footage with robot training for 24 hours makes me wonder if you can actually involve multiple environments and then uh, scale your technique up to multiple yeah, absolutely. So, and this is what we did for the grasping work. We, we, you can think of each robot as its own environment. Uh, that's actually something we're working on right now, is to basically set up multiple units of this and have them all pool experience. Yes, you mentioned a lot about the world applications of RL, but what about, you never mentioned about safety, and sometimes mm -hmm. safety in exploration, yeah. like yeah. starting from around. So th that's a very interesting question, and I have, I think there's a different answer that I would give. There's a pragmatic answer, and then there is sort of a, a science answer. The pragmatic answer is that it's very important and that what we should try to do is to build systems that, where we can enforce appropriate constraints to make it feasible to run them in the real world. Uh, the, maybe the more uh, speculative but perhaps more interesting answer is that perhaps some of the safety issues that we're likely to see are transient issues due to lack of capability. So if you have a system that is trained in, in a narrow set of environments, maybe failure to generalize is a huge concern. If you have a system that's trained in an extremely broad set of environments with a very large and powerful model, maybe it'll actually generalize pretty well, perhaps better than whatever hand-engineered constraint you can put on it. So maybe safety is more of like a bootstrapping problem than it is a fundamental problem. That once you scale things up, however you do it, then it becomes less of a concern. So in the introduction, you kind of downplay uh, insects as not having I guess a high level of intelligence. But then most of your examples are actually inset of course. behaviors. Of course. So why we should believe that these kind of techniques are gonna scale up to yeah. intelligence? I, I think that, that uh, there's sort of two ways that we can, uh, the, the, there's sort of two things that we do when we study uh, you know, mach machine learning systems of this sort. One thing that we do is we develop algorithms and we evaluate whether those algorithms are doing the things that we'd like them to do. And the other thing is, is, is really empirical science. It's like, can we scale the thing up and does it actually exhibit generalization? So uh, that's very difficult to do in RL for the reasons that I discussed. The first project that I talked about was really meant to study this insofar as it's possible to study with current techniques. And that studied generalization, but you know, admittedly for like a single task in a fairly controlled environment. To go beyond that, I think we need to get some of these other components to work. And you know, really, the, the, the science needs to proceed with these two things in parallel, that we develop better algorithms, and then as we go, we evaluate how far we can scale them up and how much we can sort of de-risk that possibility that the thing does or does not actually generalize. So the, the end goal is to remove the whole evolution 
No, I think the end goal is is to get something that scales well enough so that you can run it at you know sufficiently diverse uh, experience to get meaningful generalization. I don't think that requires you know evolving anything. Actually, I think it just requires overcoming a fairly concrete set of obstacles like automating the components that currently require meticulous hand engineering. So the assumption is that language can be learned with the same. I think if you want to have language be part of these systems, I do think that you can have a, a learning-based solution to that. I think that language uh, is a little tricky to acquire in a fully embodied and situated way. So a supervised learning approach to language is you know, reasonably straightforward because you can collect data. A reinforcement learning style approach to language basically involves interacting with people, which is arguably somewhat expensive. But potentially there is a way to do it at scale if you imagine that there's some, some kind of device out in the world that regularly interacts with humans. Uh, where do you think the future might be? Is it like uh, reinforcement learning, you train a model and several models and it will be added up somehow? Uh, or will it be the entire scenario that the robot has to traverse from, say, on Amazon floor from one place to another? How would it turn out? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And I think that there are, that question sort of entangles together a bunch of different components that we, uh, you know, that, that, that are still active areas of research, like, for example, multitask learning. You know, neural network architectures, things like that. I do think that it's quite feasible to imagine that uh, multitask learning can work very, very well. In fact, it can probably work better than single task learning insofar as multiple tasks involve sharing of data, in which case probably the, the, the way that all this would look is, is that is not that you would have different models for different tasks, but you would share a giant data set across everything, and then you would have maybe one model with you know, a few different outputs for different things that it's supposed to do. Does that kind of get at your question? All right, uh, we're sort of out of time. Uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs>